911, what is the address to your emergency? I just lost street laundry mat. What is it? Or street laundry mat. What's the problem? I got abducted. Who abducted you? Sean Green. You said John Green? Sean Greg. Where's he at now? Asleep. Where's he sleeping at? In the bedroom. In what bedroom? There's two houses right by the laundry street. And it's in one of those houses. But you're at the laundry mat? No, I'm I'm in the bedroom with them. What color is the house? Is it a crop? Maybe. If I'm looking at the laundry mat, which way is it? If you're looking in the laundry mat, it's the one on the left of the two. You don't know what color the house is? No. Does he have a car? No. Well, he's right down the street. And what's your phone number you're calling me from? And you think it's a yellow house? I think so, but it's on the left. Is it an apartment? No, it's a house. Okay, does he own the house? No, he broke into it. Does anybody actually live there? I think they've been abandoned. And his name is Sean Great? Yes. Like G-R-A-T-E? Yes. Does he have a weapon? He's got a taser. What does he look like? Is he a white male or a black male? Is he like six foot or is he shorter than that? He's like six one, six two. Do you know how much he weighs? Probably one seventy five. Are you injured? A little. What color is his hair? Brown. Do you know what color his eyes are? Yeah. What's he wearing? Nothing right now. Okay, stay in the home with me. Where did he take you from? My, my apartment. I mean, I was walking with him. You were walking with him? Mm -hmm. Or were you walking too? His place. I, I've known him for like a month and a half. Is there any way you can get out of the building? I don't know without waking him and I'm scared. Okay, is there a bathroom in the, the house? Well, his bedroom is closed, and he made it so it would make noise. And if you told him you had to go to the bathroom, he would do something to you? Yeah, because he had me tied up. So are you tied up now? Well, I, yeah, but I kind of freed myself. Is he in the same room with you? Yes. Is it his phone you have? Yes. Are they on the way? No, we have officers we're sending. Okay, hey, if, you, if you're worried, you don't have to talk. You can just set the phone down, okay? I just need to hear if the officers find you or not. Okay. Are you upstairs or are you downstairs? We're downstairs. There's a door. There's a side door on the right of the left house. And that's where we enter. Just immediately there's a kitchen right there, and then the bedroom is right right off from the kitchen. Are you bleeding from anywhere? Not anymore. What were you bleeding from? You don't have to talk if you don't need to, okay? Down. Are you still there? I'm a stalker. What? I'm a stalker. Do you hear any officers outside? No. Okay, they're in the area. See, I think you come in the side door still, like, so, um, softly. Is there a padlock on the bedroom door, or is it just a regular lock? No, I don't even. I don't even know if it's locked. It doesn't have a knob, so. Can you get up and see if you can get out? I'm afraid of waking him. If I knew the cops were right there, I would do it. I don't even know if it opens. How it opens? Is there a window around there you can look out? Yeah, but the floor squeaks and it's right by his head. Are you laying down? No, I'm standing right by the bedroom door. And you can't open it? What? Can you 
you open it? I'm afraid without making noise. Is the door to the house open? I don't know. Probably. I don't think he has a key. I'm not sure. Because I think he broke in here. Can you see out any window that you're at? They're all, um, they're all curtains shut. on the first floor. Are you at the house closest to the laundromat or the other one? Are you the one closest to the laundromat or the other one? If you were standing in the laundromat looking at the two houses, it would be on the left. Here, look out of the laundromat. So if you're looking at the laundromat, you're the one on the right. At the laundromat. If you're looking at the laundromat, you're the one on the left. Side door. Door. The side door. The side door to the right. Okay, I can hear him. Can you hear him? Yes, I do. Okay, do you think you can get out? Yeah. Are you out of the bedroom? Yes. It doesn't have a doorknob. You need to push. The door doesn't have a doorknob? Can you see them? He said push the door. Are they on the other side of the door? Yeah, I think so. She said have you guys push the door. There's no door on there. Just push it. Can you hear anybody right now? She heard the side door open. She heard the side door open. Where'd they go? I'm out of the bedroom. You're out? Okay, can you get to the door where you can see out? Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Can you get out of the house? It's locked. It's locked. Are you at the door? Yeah, I am. She's at the door. You're on the door to the right hand side of the house. Yeah. She's at the door on the right side of the house. She got out of the bedroom. Is there a window there? Yeah, I'm looking out and they tell them to come back. She said to hurry, hurry. She said to hurry up and come back. Yeah, they can see me if they it's come locked. to it. The door is locked. No, the bedroom door had no door handed. This one she it's locked. She can't get out. Can you unlock the door at all? Okay, they have her. You went on her arm. On arm? Yeah. Right. You need to go. Take You just heard the real, heart-stopping 911 call placed to Ohio Police Dispatch in 2016 by a kidnapping victim whose captor is sleeping only feet away from her. This petrified woman has found a lifeline, but as we'll find out, Jane is in more danger than she or the police could have possibly understood so far. Let's dig into the harrowing 30-year crime spree of Sean Great. I'm Lindsay. And this is Killer Bites. The 911 operator asks Jane to get out of the bed and move towards the front door to anticipate the police's arrival. Just like her, they still don't know exactly where Jane is being held. The man who'd been holding her captive for days was lying right next to her, and Jane told the dispatcher he'd set up like a booby trap of noisy objects that would alert him if she tried to open the door. She said he's strong. He could catch up to her easily if he woke up. But the operator goads her to get as far as she can toward the exit she didn't even know was there or not. For all she knew, the door outside was blocked with more stuff or locked shut. And heart-wrenchingly, that's what Jane found when she finally made it to what appeared to be the front door. It was jammed shut and Jane panicked through her state of shock. But emergency services were still on the line and through the excruciating silence, Jane thinks she finally hears officers 
walking the street outside. With the 911 operator's help, Jane directs police back toward the house that she was trapped in, and officers manage to force the door open to let Jane outside while the kidnapper still sleeps. Police found Jane bruised, bloodied, and in a state of shock when they rescued her from Sean Great, a 40-year-old drifter who was squatting in the abandoned house he'd taken Jane to. The evidence was clear when they caught him red-handed. Sean Great had kidnapped Jane and sexually assaulted her for the past three days. But as they questioned him in custody, Ashland police would uncover a trail of evidence that characterized Sean Great not just as a violent kidnapper, but a sadistic, sexually motivated serial killer who had been lingering right under their noses for years. In September of 2016, Sean Great was being interrogated for hours by police who had found him naked in bed with a woman he'd been holding captive for the past three days. He was slow to open up to police, but as he did, both Sean and investigators became confused about which crime they were discussing. Police were still processing warrants to search the rest of the property they'd found him on, but Sean assumed they had already found the other girls in the house. Sean backpedaled when he realized the truth. They really didn't know what bodies he was talking about, but it wasn't long before they found them. Once police were able to search the house, they found another woman bound and gagged in the upstairs bedroom. Her corpse had been decaying for weeks. And under one of the many piles of trash scattered throughout the house's bottom floor, the decaying body of a second woman was found. With news of murder victims coming through to headquarters, Sean's interrogation with police continued. Investigators peeled over the outstanding missing persons cases from the county. Now that they knew just how badly the kidnapping they caught Sean committing could have gone, police wanted to know how many more women he'd hurt. In the process, Sean was almost excited to explain to them his reasons why, going as far as to demonstrate his methods to detectives on camera with that debauched enthusiasm that only the most disturbing serial killers seem to pull off. Sean was born in 1976 in Marion, Ohio, to a mother who had recently divorced his father. She'd met him at the bar she worked in as an exotic dancer, and their whirlwind romance fell apart just as quickly. By the time he was eight, Sean's mother gave up custody of her children to their father. Despite his family difficulties, Sean grew to be a charming and well-liked teenager. Friends recall him having a way with words that can convince anyone of anything. And his charisma landed him a high school sweetheart with whom he'd have his first child at age 17. But their young love didn't last. Sean and his teenage girlfriend fought often. She confided in others about his cruelty, which had become physically violent. He was controlling and abusive even in this early relationship. Still teenagers and now parents, it was too much for his partner who finally decided to walk away. But when she did, Sean would have his first arrest after strangling her and what might have been an attempted murder, considering how his ensuing relationships unfolded. But the court wasn't so strict, and Sean was jailed for only a limited time before his release on parole. After the stint behind bars, Sean dropped out of high school, and friends said his drifting had continued since then. Though they were fond of his company, Sean couch surfed between his friends and family members. He bounced from one place to the next without an interest in finding a job. Instead, Sean preferred to search for more platonic and romantic relationships to depend upon and developed his rap sheet with petty thefts. In 1996, he was arrested with an accomplice and charged with residential burglary. He was sentenced to four years in prison but served only one before being released on parole again. After a second incarceration, it appeared that Sean never retained a sincere interest in reforming his behavior. All of Sean's subsequent partners could attest that his overwhelming charm had a darkness underneath, like a true to life Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Sean broke his parole when his relationship with the mother of his second child also devolved to physical abuse and violence. He struck and strangled her just like his other girlfriends, and for whatever reason, he was released from custody after yet two more arrests for incidents of violence against her. But as his second parental partner put up her boundaries, Sean tracked down another woman to father a child with. Can you guess what happened next? Sean's tempestuous, multifaceted abuse continued with the mother of 
his second son. This time, in 1999, a court ordered that Sean be blocked from any contact with his newest child or its mother before she was born. True to character, when her protection order against him was put in place, Sean confronted her and the child's grandmother outside her home with a knife in his hand. She knew what Sean was capable of. A scuffle over the weapon ensued, leaving both of them with minor cuts and injuries to their hands before police arrived to detain Sean. He was finally sent to prison for this last breach of his parole in 2003. When Sean Great was released from prison years later, he continued moving mooching off friends and family until he could use his disarming charisma to cajole vulnerable women into supporting him, one way or another. He consistently needed more control over the women he exploited, and levied darker and more reprehensible mental and physical abuses against each of them as he went on. In one incident, he sent a woman he was dating to the hospital from his violence. Once she was there, he waited for nurses to leave the room before attacking her again in her hospital bed. By the time hospital staff rushed back into the room, Sean had escaped. He went on the run and hid from police for four days before being discovered in probably the most terrifying way ever. Upon her return from the hospital, the partner Sean had abused in the hospital felt uneasy in her home. She could tell that food had been moved and things weren't the way she'd left them. She called the police and told them she feared Great was waiting for her inside of her couch. When they came to investigate, that's exactly where they found him, hidden inside the seat of her sofa, brandishing a knife. He was then formally arrested for the assault and others he committed against her that had gone unreported. It was another case of abuse repeated over and over again before authorities intervened at what seemed like the final hour. The thing about this case that I don't understand is how Sean Great can violate his parole, violate these women so many times, and still be released again to find yet another victim. By 2011, Sean was married to a new woman and expecting a third child his first daughter. But by 2012, he was again dealing with divorce proceedings for the same kinds of physical and psychological abuses that had harmed the people in his life so many times before. So Sean continued to surf couches and rack up more charges for petty crimes and driving under the influence. All the while, he kept finding psychologically vulnerable younger women to manipulate and control, luring them in with his gentle smile before revealing just how violent he was. He depended on them financially as well as emotionally. Sean had a hard time finding employers who would look past his extensive, violent criminal record. He had limited options for employment, and he found a position at the Salvation Army store to support himself. Here, he met Jane at the end of the summer in 2016. Jane was working there as well, and they had bonded at work over what Jane described as a common appreciation for the Bible and games of badminton at the park after work. I think Jane, in her eyes, was trying to help a lost soul, and her relationship with Sean was strictly platonic. But like he always did, Sean wanted more. Jane had told Sean that she didn't give anyone her phone number, that she wouldn't even allow a man into the house before an engagement, and repeatedly rejected his romantic advances. Though he was persistent, Sean seemed to have handled this rejection surprisingly well so far. In the first week of September, Sean offered Jane some lightly used women's clothes he'd found in an exchange. Jane offered to read him some passages from the Bible as a payment for them. Sean lived nearby, so after their shift together had ended, Jane walked with Sean to his house to get the bag of clothes Sean had promised to her. Bible in hand, she followed him into his home, an abandoned halfway house type of property that was previously owned by a local Christian ministry, which had used it as a kind of halfway house to rehabilitate criminals and addicts. It was a place for them to stay while they, you know, recovered their finances and got back on their feet. It's unclear what the exact status of the house was while Sean was living there. It appears to most that he was squatting there without anyone's knowledge, like it was basically abandoned. Regardless, Jane didn't know any of those details when she walked into the house with him and the clothes were nowhere to be found. Rather, he sent her upstairs to his bedroom to wait while he got them out of the car. So she sat on his bed and cracked the Bible open to find a good passage they could read. But when Sean returned, he tore the Bible from her hands and told her they wouldn't be reading any at all. There were no donated clothes. 
When he came back, he had tape and rags in his hands to bind her with, and he told her she wouldn't be going anywhere anytime soon. Sean violated Jane repeatedly for the rest of the weekend in every way possible. When they conducted their search, it was evident to detectives that he'd modified several household objects to abuse her with during her days of captivity. But during his interrogation, Sean told police that he and Jane were in love, that they discussed marriage and still would be married one day. At at some point, while she was bound and gagged, he'd shaved a heart shape in her pubic hair. As he confessed, Sean spoke to police in crazy, rambling tangents about Jane as if the horrible abuse he'd inflicted upon her was her own fault, a position many abusers take, essentially blaming the victim. His abuse was only an outburst of frustration he suffered at her obstinance. He claimed she'd been leading him on and holding him to double standards. This was a trend throughout Sean's interviews and subsequent confessions. He always gave their mental health issues or some offenses he'd taken from the women as a caveat to the inexcusable crimes he committed against them. As investigators continued to peel back the layers hiding Sean's atrocities one after the other, he identified the corpse that was found still bound in his closet as 29-year-old Ashland resident Elizabeth Griffith. Elizabeth had gone missing weeks before and was last seen on security camera footage in the Walmart parking lot. It's hard to find further information about the circumstances of her disappearance. We're not sure if she was shopping or walking to another destination when she was caught on the camera. But Sean told police that they'd been playing a game of Yahtzee at her place that day before they went over to his to make some barbecue chicken for dinner. And honestly, I have trouble believing any of the circumstantial details Sean has offered to the police. It was reported that Elizabeth had struggled with her mental health, and police were searching for her quickly after friends and family lost contact with her. Elizabeth was a paranoid schizophrenic with bouts of mania and depression, and unfortunately, it's likely Elizabeth needed more support than might have been available to her. She ended up befriending Sean only months before Jane's kidnapping. Sean told investigators that Elizabeth frequently spoke to him about no longer wanting to live. He twisted Elizabeth's mental illness into a macabre justification for his crimes. He told police that he wanted to show her that she still wanted to live by forcing her to fight for her life. More than once during their friendship, Sean had struck and strangled her for whatever reason he thought he'd come up with. And as Sean described to investigators how he finally took her life, he recalled Elizabeth praying out loud, asking God for Sean's forgiveness. Forgive him, she screamed. He don't know what he does, as he choked her to death. He told investigators it was an accident. He just wanted to show her how much she wanted to live, but had throttled her too hard. Sean said that he hogtied her hands and feet together after she died, but police assume it's more likely that he'd bound and abused Elizabeth in the same way he had Jane. Investigators found Elizabeth's body decomposing beyond recognition in a closet he duct tape shut. They also discovered homemade devices just like the ones Sean had used on Jane adjacent to Elizabeth's body. Police found the other remains in the basement of the abandoned house, fully clothed with a purse laying next to it. Inside the purse, they found the driver's license of another woman who went missing that summer, 43-year-old mother and grandmother, Stacy Stanley. Stacy had just moved to the Ashland area after living with her sister in Idaho. So they still called each other all the time and the last time they spoke was actually because Stacy had gotten a flat tire and called her sister for help. She didn't know how to change the tire and her sister was arranging for her to get picked up by a family friend or her son when Stacy told her that a nice man had come by and offered to help. Sean Great told her the tire was a one-man job and proceeded to help her with it himself before Stacy's family lost contact with her completely. The only witness who could identify Sean and Stacy at the gas station was the attendant behind the register, who'd seen them both when Stacy went in to buy Sean a coffee as a thank you for helping her out on the road. The attendant later told police that Stacy seemed grateful for the help from a stranger and was in a bubbly mood when they exited the store together. Stacy gave Sean a ride as a final token of appreciation, but but after the conversation with her sister, her family never heard from her again. Her family was concerned for her safety right away, and the day after she didn't make it home, they were in contact with police and filed an official missing persons report. However, Stacy's family said that when they tried to raise concerns with the authorities, they were pretty much stonewalled. Stacy already had a history with the law, and her family says her difficulties with substance abuse and addiction prevented her case from being taken seriously. Even though Stacy had been clean for the six months before, 
before her disappearance, was employed, and was finding a new direction for her life, her family struggled to get any attention from reporters or police on her behalf. Stacy's case was written off as a relapse, and her family was told it was most likely she was just off somewhere getting high. But Stacy's loved ones pointed to the discovery of her car abandoned with all of her belongings inside. Her phone, her bag, her wallet were all found inside the vehicle, which wouldn't make any sense for anyone to do. Stacy would still need those things even if she had relapsed. She wouldn't have just left them in the road and disappeared on her own. It was also notable that the driver's seat had been adjusted for a much larger individual, someone near Sean's height of six feet, where Stacy was a petite woman, which made it seem like someone else had driven her car just before it was abandoned. Stacy's family continued their own search for the rest of the summer, but without police taking them seriously, their petitions for a search never went answered. Her relatives even took notice of the two abandoned houses in town by the 4th Street laundromat after hearing that people might be living in them and asked police to investigate the properties more than once, but were told each time authorities didn't think she had truly disappeared. Sean told detectives that after he had helped Stacy with her flat tire, she'd rejected his sexual advances until he tried to force her and she sprayed him in the face with mace. And after she fought back against him, he became enraged and strangled her to death in in the living room of the house before stowing her body in the basement. As his interrogation went on, Sean Great rambled maniacally on and on about the victims that the police didn't even know to ask about. Before long, he had told them the location of a third body, a woman he was in a seven month relationship with named Candace Cunningham. Candace was 29 in the summer of 2015 and was actually never reported missing because she'd last told her mother that she was planning on moving to North Carolina soon and Candace had her own struggles with instability and substance abuse that left her in a marginalized place where her disappearance slipped through the cracks. But Candace was Sean's girlfriend that summer for about seven months before she was murdered and you can actually see where she'd shared one of his posts on Facebook. The post was about marriage and commitment and Candace changed her relationship status on Facebook to married shortly before her disappearance. Sean didn't go into much detail regarding the circumstances of Candace's death, but he told investigators again that Candace had trouble with suicidal thoughts and had a desire to die that he had fulfilled. He made it out like a kind of vigilante mercy killing, and who can really believe any excuse he has to offer for the unjustifiable crimes he's committed against any of these women. Candace was remembered by those in her life as a feisty ray of sunshine that made everyone laugh and was always happy to help her neighbors when they needed a hand. Sean led investigators to the location of her remains, which she had buried in a wooded area outside of town. But that's not the end of the interrogation. Sean admitted responsibility for a fourth Ohio murder. The year before, in 2015, Sean was playing pool at a local bar with a woman named Rebecca Lacey when he realized that his money clip was missing $4. He'd heard the click of its clasp while he was coming back from the bathroom, and that's the reason he gave police for taking Rebecca's life. Sean hadn't even had proof that it was Rebecca who'd stolen $4 from his wallet, but He'd strangled her anyway for this before dumping her body on the side of the road where it went undiscovered until March, a whole month after she was reported missing. When police discovered the body near Route 30 in Ashland, a toxicology report ruled her death an overdose. Her case was reopened with Sean's confession and prosecutors suspected that Great could have drugged Rebecca himself since Jane had reported that Sean forced her to take mysterious pills he identified as muscle relaxers during her torture. But Rebecca's autopsy had and isolated any signs of manual strangulation, which left investigators to depend upon a demonstration of Sean's technique. He almost seemed proud to show detectives how he'd placed his forearm around a victim's neck and his hand over their mouth from behind to strangulate them without leaving the fractures and fingerprints that are commonly detected in other methods of asphyxiation. With the number of Sean's victims rising to an unanticipated extent, the picture of a compulsive serial killer was rapidly unfolding before detectives. They kept prodding him further. Were there any more women whose lives Sean had taken? They'd push him to reveal yet another murder from as early as 2005. Sean said he couldn't even remember the name of the first woman he killed, but that it started with a D, maybe Dana or Diana. This was confirmed when Sean was able to point out the exact location of Jane Doe's 
Joe's body recovered by police years earlier. It was a dog walker who discovered human bones scattered across a field next to Victory Road in Marion County. Without any clothing, jewelry, wallet, or identification of any kind, the sheriff's office didn't have any way of knowing who the young woman might have been. An autopsy established that her death was a homicide by strangulation. The Ohio Bureau of Investigation was working for years to identify her and continue an investigation into her death that would bring her the justice that she deserved. Though she remained unidentified for 13 years, this first murder victim was identified as Dana Nicole Lowry of Minden, Louisiana, a 23-year-old mother of two who was traveling through Ohio selling magazine subscriptions. Dana had sold Sean's mother, whom he was living with at the time, several subscriptions that never materialized. Sean whined to police about his mother's constant spiteful words over the missing magazines. He told police that she'd cursed her and that that was the reason why he'd tracked Dana down in Ashland months later. He approached Dana under the pretense of purchasing more subscriptions, but then he used a knife to force Dana into his car. He abducted her as well for who knows how long before stabbing her and strangling her to death. Sean made it out to police that he'd murdered a young woman for the first time as revenge when his mother's magazines never arrived. Right. But detectives already knew that Sean immediately resorted to horrific violence as soon as his sexual advances were rejected. And even if they weren't, they suspected that this attack too was essentially sexually motivated. Just because Dana's body wasn't identified for nearly 13 years after she went missing, it didn't mean that her family in Louisiana wasn't desperate to find out what exactly had happened to her. Dana had two young daughters at home, and while she was traveling for her work, she always called them where they stayed with their grandparents every night before bedtime. They knew the first night that she missed that call to her girls that something was wrong, but with her disappearance occurring so far away, her family was at a loss with where to even begin. Dana had disappeared into thin air until police detained Sean so many years later. At this point, police wanted Sean Great behind bars again as soon as possible for as long as possible. With Sean's confessions and the implicating evidence laid out clearly, prosecutors steadily built their case against him. While in jail awaiting trial, Sean began writing to local and national news services. In the letters, Sean spun a creepy narrative about the crimes he'd committed. He railed against the perceived impact of state welfare services upon society in true nutjob fashion, even though he himself had been on welfare throughout his life of unemployment and exploitation. Whether he was looking for attention or he was just twisted enough to truly believe what he'd written, or probably both, he described the women he'd brutalized and murdered as the zombie victims of the system. He claimed his victims were barely alive enough to take care of themselves. Sean wrote that he wasn't guilty of committing a crime at all. The women were already dead without lives of their own to claim. While most newspapers, luckily, declined from publishing any of his crazy ramblings, and both the prosecution and defense teams in the case obtained a gag order to stop Sean from communicating with the media anymore. Sean's defense lawyer pushed for a verdict of not guilty by reason of insanity, but Sean's psychiatric psychiatric evaluation deemed him of sound enough mind at the time of the murders to understand what he was doing was wrong and to hide the evidence he committed the crimes. Police continued to speak with Sean until the trial to gather any more information they could about the murders he'd confessed to and any he might not have. Detectives established a rapport with their suspect that became integral in the securing of Sean's confessions. And once he was imprisoned, they found out that Sean had been receiving an unprecedented amount of jail mail. Letters from fans, or whatever you'd call someone who idolized someone as terrible as this, trickled in every week. When officers asked Sean what people wrote to him about, he told them about a writer who'd asked him who his favorite serial killers were and if he had any inspirations. Detectives asked him to answer the question for them too. What serial killer did he feel he resembled most? Sean thought about it with a chilling matter of factness. He told them that he identified with Ted Bundy because, in his words, Bundy was just completely heartbroken. At trial, prosecutors argue that Jane, the woman police had found being held against her will in the abandoned Ashland house Sean was squatting in, was his only victim who hadn't fought back against him and that was the only reason she'd survived long enough to escape. The women he'd killed had done nothing to provoke the claiming of their lives, but Sean became enraged each time his sexual advances were rejected. They pointed to his confession, in which he blamed each victim for their own deaths for one irrational reason or another. Sean was indicted on 23 counts, from first degree murder to burglary and tampering with evidence. Prosecutors said that considering the depraved actions and gruesome evidence 
evidence collected in the cases, the state was seeking the death penalty. Sean showed no remorse in the courtroom and ended up pleading guilty to 15 counts. And on May 7th of 2018, jurors found him guilty of murdering Stacey Stanley and Elizabeth Griffith. He was sentenced to death on June 1st with an execution date of September 13th that year. But as they often do, Sean's legal team submitted an appeal to the Ohio Supreme Court that stayed the execution until Sean's appeal could be evaluated. In the meantime, Sean pled guilty to the murders of Rebecca Lacey, Candace Cunningham, and Dana Lowry in 2019 and was sentenced to life in prison without parole for all three murders. In 2020, Sean Great's appeal to the Ohio Supreme Court was dismissed. He's currently scheduled to be executed on March 19th, 2025. But there was another snag. The state of Ohio stopped using lethal injections for their executions in 2020, but the state has yet to legalize any other method of execution. Inmates on Ohio's death row are still in a state of limbo until legislators can compromise on a new method of execution to commit their sentences. At least Sean has finally faced justice for all of the pain and abuse he inflicted on the people around him for his entire life. Even though the authorities' intervention came too late to save the lives of three innocent women, who deserved so much more. There's little chance that Sean will ever be released from prison and will die in jail if his execution takes longer than 2025. This case really exemplifies the immense difficulties that the women of marginalized communities face when seeking action from authorities. I think all of us can do better to look past our prejudices to help others in need. And the spirits of these women live on to remind us never to take the disappearances of anyone, no matter who they are, for granted. Thank you so much for watching Killer Bites. I'm Lindsay, and we'll see you next time.